What's up, y'all? It's Jeff Cobb, and you're listening to Ricky and Clive Wrestling Show on Social Suplex Podcast Network. You're listening to the Ricky and Clive Wrestling Show. Listener discretion is advised at all times. Thank you once again for downloading and listening to another episode of the Ricky and Clive Wrestling Show, part of the Social Suplex Podcast Network. My name is Clive and I'm joined by my brother from another prophet, Ricky. <laughs> How are you this evening? Uh, yeah, I'm alright yourself. I'm alright. I seem to have a multi-day toothache and it seems to not be going away so I'm starting to panic that there might be an emergency dental appointment in my near future yeah, I thought that was going to be some sort of segue to a joke well it won't but my appointment might be at Tooth Hurty we'll just wait and see oh Jesus oh, God so before what, a ter- what a terrible start to the podcast before we start officially there is there is an apology to be made yep an apology to One Nation Radio, Rich and James. You can listen to their podcast on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Uh, we were meant to have them on tonight. Uh, unfortunately, I'm having to travel away with work in a in a few hours' time. So, you know, if time difference, like we couldn't do it. We were actually hoping to get them on. Like I says we were planning to start about 11, 12 o'clock our time. Uh, but unfortunately, like I said, I'm travelling tonight for work um, but we will hopefully get them on well it was not hopefully I think the plan is to get them on hopefully soon though I like how you started the apology with a plug for their podcast which you can also oh, find on so Lords of Pain Radio on Tuesday nights guys as well it's, it's the least I could do <laughs> since it was my cock up it was we, we'll, we'll both shoulder the blame so uh Survivor Series has taken place, War Games has taken place. All in all, would you say it was a, a decent weekend of wrestling? Um, bar maybe a, a few things that I never liked. Yeah, it was. Um, I don't have any real genuine complaints, if I'm honest. Um, it kind of went, some, some of it went the way I expected, one or two little surprises, but overall... I thought it was quite a solid weekend of wrestling. Well, we start with some war games action then. Yep. So, what would you say? I mean, four or four slash four and a half matches were on the card, so there isn't many to pick from. But were there any contenders for match of the night for you? Oh, I mean, Gargano, Alistair Black is quite clearly match of the weekend for me. Um. Oof. Well, I don't even know where to begin with that match. Um, if you want to start off with the <clears throat> the character arc and the storyline we've been told about Johnny Gargano's character, how he's this kind of like white hot baby face and he kind of turns and it's, he attacks Alistair. Um, and for me, it kind of Tommaso Champ is at like the heart of it all. He's as we said the last time uh, when he had the title match was at Brooklyn that. He lost a match, the last two matches, because he was so consumed by hatred. And his hatred sort of made him lash out at Alistair Black because there was no one else that sort of, he went looking for Champa and only saw Black and he lashed out. Um, to Alistair Black coming out with uh, one of the greatest sort of lines you'll ever hear in professional wrestling where he absolved J- J- Johnny oh. Gargano of his sins as if he was some sort of satanic priest in a sense mm-hmm. I love that. Um, love that so much not just that yeah. but a lot of the stuff about that black t- you know, like if you go into a confession box to c- confess your sins to a priest and you know they can sort of absolve your sins it was just and then hits them with the most vicious looking black mass it was just you know everything about that match was great um, and um, like I said I think 
in terms of Gargano's development as a character, I think you can certainly go a, diff- a couple of different ways here. Mm-hmm. I think you can kind of naturally turn him back into a babyface, and you could almost be like his character has taken like a, a detour because he was consumed by the hatred towards Champa, and he kind of understands to rid himself of this, he has to sort of vanquish Champa in a sense, uh-huh. or you can continue with the heel. Um, but yeah, that that match from start to finish was just unbelievable. Gar- Gano hit the sort of the two double DDTs where. The first one we were diving through the ropes to the outside and hits a DDT and then followed up with a DDT on sort of the the, ring, the edge of the the edge of the ring. Um, I, you know, I, I'm like we said, so we don't talk about, or oh, how would we give these would it, what star ratings etc. We would give for these kind of matches, but for me it's just always a simple case of will I remember the match? Will I go back and watch it? And <laughs> it's a definitive yes for both of those. Yeah. The. There is possibility of Gargano going back to being faced. I think the story allows for that because that vignette that he had leading up to it where he was saying, um, I'm not afraid of the dark and I kind of like it here. Well, I think what happened... For, I think I, I went on a bit about this on Twitter at the weekend, but this was more of a, an Alistair Black match for me than it was a Gargano one. The coming out, the entrance, with the, coming through, walking through the candles of his own black mass... The horns, the sort of demon skin that he was wearing in the attire, the demon skin on one of his boots, said to me, I'm going all kayfabe here, but he still has one foot firmly planted in hell. Um, And as you say, it was basically like some sort of satanic priest thing where if you want to come to the dark side, you got to answer to me first, and you're not ready yet, so on your way, young man. It was quite the actual action was centred a lot around head strikes and head trauma, which is what you would believe was happened in the, the parking lot that they had the incident in. Just the, the strikes in general. Uh, we've seen these guys play off each other before in that fatal four-way they had with, I think it was Lars Sullivan and Killian Dane as well, in a sort of number one contender match. So we knew these guys could bring it, but the, the level of story that was applied to it as well, I just thought that was, from a sort of character standpoint, that was a fine, fine twenty odd thirty minutes for Alistair Black, and there were good match, really good matches also in the card. But this one stood out for me, and it will be one I'll remember for a long time. And the absolve you of your sins line was just phew, powerful stuff, unbelievable. And I think it was just a kind of kind of timely reminder to everyone from Alistair Black in NXT and Triple H etc. that. This guy is legitimately one of the best they've got. Um, you know, maybe in the last sort of four or five months, we've it's all been about Champion Gargano, etc. Um, I know Black was injured, but I think this was just a kind of timely reminder that to let everyone know that this guy is also one of the best around. Um, and like you say, the some of the head kicks and punches and etc. was it was a real hard, hard hitting affair. Uh-huh. Um, and like you say, even just where he hits Gargano a couple of times towards the end and Gargano's like, he kind of holds him up to prevent him from falling down and as he's falling down you see him lifting him his back, back up and his foot underneath the chin before ultimately turn around and say I, I, I absolve you of your sins um, you know from start to finish I thought the match and the storyline was excellent and there's, let's say there's so many different ways you can go now you can kind of have Gargano go back and sort of find himself in a sense mm-hmm. um, you can then go have Black to get his rematch against Champa or you could like you, say, you could do that at the takeover at Royal Rumble in Arizona or you could do it on an NXT taping you could maybe bring Black up at that point um, I don't think Alistair Black wins the NXT title again to be honest I think his next call in Paul is going to be on the main roster and if this was kind of like his last hurrah uh, NXT, you know, it was what a fucking unbelievable match to put on. Uh huh. It was a belter. But it, it really w- was. It wasn't the only standout performance of the night because the Champa and Velveteen Dream match was also another cracker. And Dream, basically a year to the day, he's, he made a name for himself in the Alistair Black match, funnily enough, at War Games 1 where he came across, he was wanting Black to say his name constantly, and we've seen him evolve into sort of an insecure, 
insecure in himself to becoming much more confident and 12, 12 months later he's confident enough that he knows what Champa's doing in his matches he stayed with Champa the whole time he knew what Champa's game was and there were it was one of those matches that it felt predictable going into it but on at least two occasions I thought Dream is about to win this title here it just had that feel about it and it was I think that helped reinforce Champa's Champa's being a heel because you wanted Dream to win so much that Champa walked away with yet another victory with with one boot on might I add as well he's walking mm. about with his lovely white tennis socks on and he still walks away with the victory so it, it just makes you hate him that wee bit more and like you said there legitimately was like a couple of occasions where you thought oh they're about to sort of pull the trigger mm-hmm. so to speak with Velveteen Dream and put the title on him um, do you know what I thought I felt Rance on Twitter kind of I thought summed up perfectly with Velveteen's performances he came out with what did they do they had the Hogan attire they had the some of the, the Savage Elbow he had the figure of four um couple of uh, moves as well and it was like Rance kind of just says that this is Velveteen's love letter to wrestling yes and I thought that was that was quite well put if I'm honest um, everything about him you know he's he's an absolute star um, I would I would have liked to win a title but I just feel like I'm not re- we're not ready yet Champa's reign is not ready to end yet still has some legs on it and at the start of the match, you kind of, they kind of played off each other's sort of like insecurities or the thing they, they most care about in a sense. Where uh, Champa got hold of his sort of his bandana, <clears throat> and you could see how 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 much that kind of got to Velveteen Dream, and he comes out and picks up Goldie. Um, I thought things like that was quite well done. Um, overall, I think this this was probably. This was, I think, my favourite Velveteen Dream match since the Alistair Black one. Um, and it also kind of re-enhanced, if anyone had any doubts, it kind of re-enhanced the belief that Champa is also one of the main guys there and it wasn't just the storyline, etc., that that made him so hot against Gargano. Like, I thought both guys really really told a good story, put on a really good match. Um, and I thought something was going to happen when his book came off. Like, I thought that was... I don't know if that was going to... I thought maybe that would have led to some sort of, like, dodgy finish or whatnot, but it didn't. Um, really conclusive. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, I think this probably was my second favourite match of the night. I think. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, the, the War Games match itself was phenomenal. It's, it's quite a niche format, niche rules and stipulations. But if you just accept for accept them for what they are, and you know what you're going to get going into it, then there's no uh, there's no stopping enjoying it. And I don't know about you, but when the the baby faces entrance music, where they were all coming down separately with the war paint on, I was f- very pumped, and it was so good to hear. I try my best not to think about validation and stuff, but to hear Pete Dunne's entrance music. Not only closing the takeover, but in the main event of a takeover, and him with that UK title just hanging out of his teeth, the fists clenched against his jaw. That was a for for guys who've followed Pete Dunne since the very beginning in January last year, his beginning of his WWE career. That felt very affirming, career affirming, and I think with with Dunne, there's definitely unfinished business with Ricochet. I've got a feeling that. There could be. I, th- I said this on Perfect Ten last week. I have a feeling, and it's just not even fantasy booking, but just I wouldn't be surprised if Ricochet dropped the title, the North American title, on a taping at some point over the Christmas period, and in the lead up to uh, the takeover, is it Arizona? You said they'll have sure. a match between Dunn and Ricochet in the UK for the UK title. So maybe that's why they've been rushing these UK tapings. Uh, the having double bills for NXT UK for the last few weeks because they're trying to catch up and they've got a plan to have Ricochet involved in some of the tapings. I get that's just it's a bit out there in terms of predictions but they've got unfinished business and it's all about the titles now so 
Do you see so that? a couple of things. Um, again, we're probably biased, but you know how they had Pete Dunne locked up and then they had to release him from a cage and then you kind of saw the panic on Undisputed Era's face as he was kind of making his way down and coming into the cage. Like uh, they, they know what they've got with him. Like they could have easily have given that kind of spot to Ricochet, but they gave it to Pete Dunne. Um, and also the fact that he was one of the guys that pinned, got the one and um, him and Ricochet kind of pinned him at the same time. I think I don't know if it was a report or someone else that said it. Like I think that was done intentionally for a reason, uh, to sort of go on to your point. I could probably see it going the other way. I could maybe see Pete Dunne dropping the NXT UK title and then going after the North American title. Right. Um, as a full time NXT America guy mm. because UK's still got to find its footing in terms of a draw so to speak um, that, maybe not full time but certainly full time ish for a few months um, maybe still appearing in NXT UK just to kind of sort of stay there Um but I would be surprised, I'd be really surprised if we saw Ricochet in NXT UK. Um, I know. For me, I think I think it's more possible the other way. I mean, it'd be great if we saw him, you know. Oh, definitely. Um, but there definitely is going to be some sort of programme because they kind of still themselves have unfinished business because the match they had on NXT, what was it, about six weeks ago or so, mm-hmm. that was in, it was interrupted by Undisputed Era. So there's still some unfinished business there. And obviously, Undisputed Era are just amazing. They always are in everything they do, but much respect goes to the War Raiders. I've not been, ex- the only exposure I had to them before NXT was in the Wrestle Kingdom match at the start of the year. And since then, I thought, okay, they're a decent tag team. They've got good star power. They're confident and comfortable in themselves. But that was. That was a star-making performance from both of them. Hanson especially uh, was on fire on Saturday night. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree, because that, um, that was the only exposure I had to him was earlier on the year at Wrestle Kingdom. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like I say, the match itself, it's kind of long. Um, I don't know if there's any way they could sort of shorten it, but... I still enjoyed the match. Um, the face off they had after um, when they met, sort of like face to face. One team was on one ring, the other one the other ring. That's, that was a pretty cool moment. Um, and then Ricochet pulls off that double moonsault. Oh god, I like it's just it's. It's just frighteningly good, frighteningly amazing just how great he is. It's scary, frightening. It's so, so scary. Um, he does the flip out of the ring onto the, onto the ramp when he came face to face with Velveteen Dream and then comes and does something like this. Um, could not fucking believe it. Couldn't believe it when I saw it. Because <laughs> you, you, you don't anticipate him doing something like that. I knew he would do something, but not to that level. No, that was just, that was ridiculous. I think he's got everything. He's got strength he does. because he deadlift suplexed um, Donovan Dijak a good few months ago, who's six foot seven at the very least, probably got a good 50 pounds on him, and he deadlift suplexed him, so he's got the strength, he's got that charisma, he's got the high flying, he's... Not super uber conf- like comfortable on the mic, but he's still, I think it's one of those ones where he's saying the right things. One of those things that Vince will pay attention to. And the thing is, like, he isn't, he doesn't look small either, I don't think. Like, height wise, you know, he doesn't look as small as someone like, say, Adam Cole or anyone. Um, mm. and he's got some beef on him, so that's probably. So I, beef I, I know a, a lot way. of people feel like he could go end up being at two o five, but I think I don't think he will. I think he's, I think he's big enough, big enough to be on the main, like on Raw SmackDown. Probably more suited to SmackDown, but. Let's just trying to see what his build weight is. I mean, it will be low. Oh, it will be, but it's more, I'm, I'm I'm more so meaning towards it. I'm more so meaning his height. Um. 
Oh, so stupid. He says he is. He says he's five foot nine. He looks a lot taller than that. I know. It's these also stupid metrics with their kilograms, and I'm from Europe as well. Uh, Eighty-eight times two point two. Oh, it's. What are you trying to do? Figure out his weight in pounds. One nine six. <laughs> So he's perfect for two or five. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine a ma- <laughs> imagine a match between him and Mustafa Ali. Yeah, him and Buddy Murphy. Um, yeah, but I, I, like I said, he's still got plenty of time in NXT. Um, oh, I have. But like I said, we're going to get Pete Dunn Ricochet. Whether it might be even be next takeover, but we'll definitely be getting it soon. Mm-hmm. The, I'd like you to give me your thoughts on the women's match and I'll explain why I'm not giving too many on that in a wee moment <laughs> Baszler and Kairi saying I hope it's the end of the feud first of all I think it will be I think the ending maybe kind of led you to believe maybe I know it was a kind of it was a real you know the heels get involved but then you had Dakota Kai and Leo, Leo Shirai come down. It kind of maybe think they might go three on three. The first pinfall was quite quick. Um, yes. For a, for a minute, I genuinely thought, right, they're going to have Shayna get the first pinfall and then get the second one. I thought they were going to do it really, really quickly and I thought for a second Shayna might win 2-0. Um, listen, I enjoyed the match. I did. I thought it was a good match. Um, I can sit and watch Shayna all day long, uh-huh. all day long. I think she's she's unbelievable. Um, I do hope, like it says, that this is the ending of the feud. Um, but specifically the one on one. But overall, I thought it was a real good match. Um, I don't know if it was my. My favourite out of the ones they've had? Oh, I would say Brooklyn, probably. Yeah, that was pretty damn good. Um, even, I, I think I've maybe preferred the one at Evolution as well. Uh-huh. Um, but, yeah, like I said, overall, I think all their matches have been good. And no real complaints, other than the fact that I think now is the time to sort of move on from it. Aye. See, there's this. There seems to be six women thing going on. So you've got Marina Shafir and Jessamine Duke. Correct me if I said their names incorrectly. Um, and then Dakota Kai, who all of a sudden has grown a pair. <laughs> um, and Io Shirai as well. So there might be one more blow off match, and it would probably be the three horse women that will win that one. Individual moments in the match that I really enjoyed were the reversed suplex into the DDT onto the apron and also the the way that Kairi Sane adapted evolved to no sorry, Shayna Baszler adopted and evolved to the insane elbow by catching it and turning it into a crucifix oh, pin. Oh, oh. That was like sublime. So good, so clever from Baszler. She's been a victim of that a few times now and she knows how to deal with it and I just thought that was a really good, just excellent way to win. The first pinfall, as you say, was very quick. And at that point of the pay-per-view, now, it should go without saying that the last three matches did save it for me overall. The last three matches were excellent. And I was starting to not enjoy it early on because of the quick pinfall and what we were hoping, getting our own expectations up, obviously, that this was going to be some sort of 30, 40 minute epic. But I can't really remember much of the match because, see, the start of the night, I did not like it at all. What was Matt Riddle? Yep. Now, this squash match that he had a few weeks ago, it was all right, nothing special. We're not supposed to see how great it can be in these squash matches, just fleeting glimpses now and again, but the match itself, right, so Matt, Matt Riddle makes an impact with his big knee, to catch his Ono in a less, like, not even 10 seconds victory. Ono looks like a fool for moaning 
about being uh, Regal's new toy, new shiny toy in Matt Riddle. About them, like they have to go through Ono, oh who's the gatekeeper, and he does so with ease. So there's a few things that annoy me about this, right? One, that bro thing has got to go. <laughs> bro, bro, bro. It's just so pastiche. <laughs> oh, fuck. Right. So far, again, I might be unfair. I've not seen anything from Matt Riddle that I haven't seen from anyone else yet. Another thing, Cassius Ono has been, I would say he has been overlooked in NXT. And this is one of those things where it's art imitating life. I mean, okay, there's issues, there's maybe aesthetic issues with his physique. But look at his, look at the guy, look at his moveset. Every, every single move that he does, you could easily consider it as a, enough for a 1, 2, 3 victory. So I just don't buy that someone of his size, frame, and toughness would fall to a knee so quickly. But the main issue for me is where this art imitates life is, Cassius Ono was spot on. It's not Regal as such. It's Triple H and Regal. They've got a shiny new toy. And this is a formula that NXT have grown into quite a, like an obvious pattern of late where they've got a new signing that appears in the front row of the takeover. They make waves, they do vignettes, they squash the talent. Then they get that inevitable win at the, their first takeover. So that new toy comes in and everyone fawns over them. And there are there are people who are being overlooked. I mean, look at what's his name, EC3. Even on NXT, he screams mid card to me, and nothing about him says main event. EC3 is destined for the raw main event. Right, that's fair enough. And we've got Lars Sullivan, who's going to be boring people to tears in the main event soon. <laughs> That's, that's harsh. So, to touch on Riddle, the shiny new toy they've got is maybe the shiniest toy they've ever got in a long time. Right? Okay. Um, to touch on him hitting over the one knee on Ono, Riddle was a pretty good mixed, mar- mixed martial artist as well. He has that brown background. Could legitimately beat the shit out of Cassius Ono. Point number three, I don't give a fuck about Cassius Ono, so I couldn't care less that he got buried. I know you don't. And I remember you saying that before. Um, I don't really have much a problem with it. I know early indications where it's supposed to be a dark match. I think you're saying that... But I think you kind of need to give it time because... I think when you get to see Matt Riddle having like proper matches and not just squash matches, you kind of realise he's quite unique. I mean, his entrance and well, also his, his ring gear, his ring attire is unique in itself. When he comes down, he wears like just shortest of shorts, and but yeah, he's this absolute machine. You know, doesn't wear any, doesn't wear, doesn't wear shoes, wrestles barefoot as well comes down in, in flip flops but in time you're going to see just how kind of great he is um, I get I know what you're saying like the kind of showcase people at ringside at, at takeover and they kind of get excited and so at the end of the day when you bring in someone new someone big like that someone's got to kind of be the sacrificial lamb um, and they got a new shite they brought out another shiny toy at the weekend because they paraded the X-Pac which suggests that he's going to be debuting <laughs> on the takeover soon oh that, that was funny well done I like that one fucking dog that, what, that um, one joke was better than all of them combined well done thanks um, yeah just give it time because I think you're going to realise just how how great Riddle is um, like don't be surprised if he's in the main event scene quite quickly as well right I'll try and elaborate, but I, I don't know if I'm getting a point across. I think more so you're probably annoyed the fact that as it basically comes down to they've got a shiny new toy, but you've got guys like Cassius Ono who are kind of overlooked. But on top of not only being overlooked, he's actually good in the ring and he's got a good move set. And when he speaks, he doesn't follow through. His actions don't follow through with his words. 
I mean, I get this, the kayfabe side of things where he's been talking the talk and when it comes to it, he can't walk the walk. I get that. But these shiny new toys, and it goes back to what we said, what I said, sorry, at the start of the year, where they're just, I think they're, the acquiring of new talent, it needs to slow down a bit. And some a cynical part of me thinks they're doing this just to get a cheap pop that lasts a few weeks because EC three's an afterthought now, and it's the same. This is the same problem that's happening on the main roster with wrestlers hogging all the spotlight. It's happening on NXT too, and because because there's not much room on the main roster as it is, these shiny new toys have been chiselled to perfection, like metaphorically, right? And they're not booked to everyone's really high expectations. And this acquire, they're, they're acquiring to the point of saturation. And that stems in NXT and it has a, not a trickle down, a trickle up effect, so to speak. And I think it's a problem that not many people want to have a conversation about. Granted, right, the takeovers are great. So on the night, on the night in question, it doesn't matter that the likes of EC3 is being underutilised. But if he's going to be, See if he was underutilised on the main roster, that would be deemed a big failure. Who in NXT do you feel is underutilised apart from AC3? Or not been given enough exposure? Right. See the the mid card tag scene? They'll they'll never do anything. The mighty uh okay, stakes and weights guys are a good laugh, but Vince will take one look at them and go I, I'm meaning just more so in NXT as opposed to when you think they might be getting called up Keith Lee mm-hmm. EC, EC3 but I said I think everybody knew it when they signed EC3 to NXT everyone was saying it. yeah fine he'll be fine but his real calling is the main event because his Social media game, promo, presentation, the way he carries himself, etc., is A+. In-ring ability is solid enough, but it's the character and his promo skills that's going to really... And just the way he looks is what Vince is going to be attracted to, and that's why he'll be... I think he'll be... It may not be like... Like... You know, the standout guy on Raw, but he'll certainly be featured on, like, the upper card... Well, it's, I don't think it will be maybe on the periphery of the main event and then out of the main event, but certainly at the top of the middle, uh, top of the middle card. I mean, Triple H's premise is to um, sort these people out, get them prepped and ready for the main roster. When in actuality, like it's better to just think of it as a brand on its own. But there are so many people being brought in that. Both all the brands don't know what to do with them. There's just so many of them. So when you get the likes of Bobby Roode, Nakamura, they're coming in, and it seems like nothing. Almas, they're not doing what the people want them to do on the main roster. You think it's a failure, but it's just there's too much. I'm losing. I'm losing my point. I've lost the thread entirely. Let's just cancel. Uh, you're probably. I think you will just think there's just far too many. Too many talent. There's too many. Far too many wrestlers. And, and under the WWE umbrella as a whole. Yes. And well, some of those some of those other guys could be featured in NXT UK. NXT uh, do house shows and they'll continue to expand and they'll continue doing more dates. Don't get me wrong, I think I think there is too many people on the rosters. I agree. But if I'm in Vince McMahon's position and I see someone like Omega or whoever even if someone like if Neville became available or whatever, I I if I'm a visit man, my mentality would be that I'll get I'll snap you up, bring you in, I'll figure out what to do with you later on because in his eyes it's better you're here than you are out with the enemy. Okay. And I know it's it's like kind of like holding talent, but <laughs> why would you let these great talents go elsewhere? I understand you need to have. You need, we need to come in and have a plan for them, and that part I completely agree on. But at the same time, why would you just let your rivals have a free pass at some of these great, great talents? Mm-hmm. But, like I said, a lot of the guys, 
we're always talking about a push, but a lot of the guys just you just don't get to see featured very often. And like I know Almas has been in the ring with Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles, etc. But at some point, the penny has to drop what they have in him. And what they have in him is one of the top five guys or whatever in the company, wrestling wise, ability wise. Mm-hmm. In my mind, he deserves to be in that conversation. I just think there's a lot of talent that's not being used as per people's want on the main roster, but I think that's happening on NXT as well. And unlike you, I'm a fan of Cassie Sono. Whenever I see him in the ring, I think. I never want to be in the receiving end, receiving end of any of his "quote unquote" worked elbows or kicks. He's devastating. Yeah, uh, uh, I get that, but going back to what happened, the takeover. It's it's Matt fucking Riddle. Like you know, he's he's a legitimate badass anyway. So I personally don't have a big problem with what went down. Maybe I'm just not on board the Matt Riddle train yet. You probably will be soon, though. If there's, this will probably be... People won't agree with what I'm saying about this, so hit us up on Twitter about this, at Wrecking Clive, and please send us some of your recommended Matt Riddle matches so I can get on board, because at the moment I'm just not buying it. And it's another, it just says to me, here's another shiny new toy who jumps the queue in front of other people who may have put in a lot more work. Mm. Shall we move on? Aye. Because I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> Bottom line is f- fuck Cassius Oro. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nah, I'm taking it too far. But yeah, let's move on to Survivor Series. Okay. Again, same question. What would you consider matches of the night? Oh, it's Charlotte Wonder. Um, probably closely followed by Seth and Nakamura. Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it for me. The Charlotte Wonder match was really good. I really enjoyed the intensity of it all, and. With what happened after the match, Charlotte beat down Ronda Rousey. Even with her explanation on Tuesday night at SmackDown, was that necessary? Was she just... I mean, she explained that she was carrying on the the mantle for Becky Lynch, taking it to be, taking it to Ronda, just how Becky would have done. But I don't, I don't know, it was just a bit strange. But Becky would have done it within... The rules of the match. And I was talking to Rance after it. And I need to pull up this conversation because I was, I've even said it to you. I'm not entirely sure about that finish to the match. I didn't, I didn't know if I liked it or not. And I guess I was kind of looking for you and, you and Rance to maybe convince me otherwise. But. Like even that, like, like I do love heel Charlotte. I really, really do. Oh, I've, that what, goes without saying for me as well. Heel Charlotte, right? The way she carried herself and she spoke to people in, during the match, etc., was unbelievable. You know how she just kind of degrade people during the match and say things to them. Uh huh. I hate to say it to you, but she, you know she was doing stuff. With, like that before Becky Lynch was doing it. Yep, that's true. Um, it just kind of, as soon as she started doing it, it made me think that Charlotte believes she can't beat her, and this is why she's resorting to foreign objects. To a certain extent, yep, because Cole and Graves were talking about how Cole said, yes, I can understand the kendo stick, although it was very random to just all of a sudden see a kendo stick out, out, <laughs> out of nowhere. Yeah, and... I'll wait and see how it plays out Yes. I'll wait and see how it plays out but I think she was kind of getting across the point that I don't even know if she meant she's been on the receiving end of injustices or she's just been or she's just going to revert back to who she really is 
because some of her tweets that she posts she's put out. Because um, she took it to the Iconics as well on Tuesday night. Yeah. I'm just going to wait and see where this ends up. I'm just going to wait and see where it ends up. Her explanation seemed to be definitely still a sort of brand supremacy thing. And, uh, yeah, and she just wanted to beat her up for Becky. And it's like, right, well... But... That's what I don't get because don't they, Becky, Becky's just been putting a beating on you for the last two or three months, and now all of a sudden you're going to—I don't know. Like I said I was just really not so much confused, but more like you've just given up. Um, you've just gave up hope right in front of our eyes. I'll kind of wait to see where it goes because we all know just how great heel Charlotte is. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll wait and see. But overall, I felt you know the match was really really good. Um, Ronda's getting better. Yeah, she's still green. Yeah, should should be in this position. You know, it's up for debate. But you know, it was it was a it was a real good match, and I don't think there's any doubt who the best female wrestler in the company is. Everyone can turn around and say Becky Lynch, but it sure as hell shit ain't Becky Lynch. It's uh, Nia Jax. Uh, Nia Jax. Everyone bows down bows down to the queen. <laughs> And I suppose the ending of the match kind of it also it leaves the door open as well for two here to run it back to kind of go all back and have another match and get a conclusive finish. Um, yes. Whether it be a rumble or whether they go triple threat at WrestleMania, I'm not entirely sure. It it kind of elevates Charlotte to where Becky was, and that's probably what management decided to do with it. They thought if they make Becky as unhinged and crazy. As Becky has been, then granted it might get some sort of crowd reaction, but it's making her just as dangerous as Becky, and I think that's what has been missing from Charlotte the last couple of months. Because, like we said, this just goes back to heel. Charlotte was a fucking machine as well. She was unbelievably dangerous. I know she had that period where she went back and forth with Sasha, and Sasha, and they were kind of dropping the title like every week. It seemed like, but you know. For for most part, for her entire heel run, she was dominant. Uh huh. Well, I'm going to be biased with my match of the night preference and saying Ali versus Murphy for the cruiserweight title. A lot of people I've spoken to were unhappy that Murphy retained, but this was his like second match back, second televised match back after winning at Super Showdown. There's things still going on between Murphy and Tony Nice. And there's also still things going on between Murphy, eh, sorry, Ali and Cedric Alexander. Alexander's got this redemption angle thing going on. He's going to turn on quite soon. Soon, not yet. Alexander's going to get another couple of wins under his belt before he decides, right, I'm going to... I mean, I wouldn't actually be surprised if Alexander beat Murphy, like before Ali, Uh within the next few weeks. But as, as biased as I am, it wasn't actually about the story for me this time it was just the spotlight that they got and I think they did well for themselves a few callbacks in their matches to previous um, like high spots within the three or four matches they've had before chance of 205 chances this is awesome that's all I was happy for they got a good amount of time as well told a good story in the ring Buddy Murphy came across as a, a beast Ali showcased his offence as well so from that, just from that alone, I was like, sort of quietly, comfortably relieved. Not relieved. I was saying that as if I was panicking. I'm just satisfied with what they put on. They're relieved, relieved, probably could be a, a. I think it could be a right word in describing how you could have felt because it was like it wasn't so much you were worried that it was going to be a good match. You're just like, oh, they did have a good match, and now. No one, people can't continue shitting on it or not want to watch it, and they put on another good match for a second sort of pay per view for another. Um, is it the second time in the last three pay per views they've had a mm-hmm. two or five live my two or five live match on it? And I said a Survivor Series, one of the big four, they were on the actual main main pay per view. It wasn't was, on the pre show yeah, or anything. That was a relief more than anything because yeah. we'll talk about the pre show carry on in a wee while. I mean, if anyone wants to keep, if anyone wants to keep shitting on two hundred five live, then I think if you do that though, you're shitting on it. It means you're not actually watching it. Uh huh. Because it was evident that night 
that they've got good wrestling on show. Mm-hmm. There was even a hype package, one of the few matches that got the vignettes. Do you know, I'm just going to come out and say it. Fuck it. Staff Ali is the best wrestler in the WWE. <sighs> I thought Nia Jax was. Yeah. If he's not the best, I think he's top two or three, without a doubt in my mind. Uh-huh. I just, I, he offers so he's, much. He's special, like, in every possible way. And I've said it time and time again. If Pete or Vince could get past, like, 205 and how he's a quote-unquote vanilla midget or whatever, man, that guy could just... That guy would bring in so much money for you and would legitimately be like this massive star just because just how great of a person he is. Yep, because he does a lot of community work as well. So I'm saying. Like you've, you've, I've seen it on Twitter, people reaching out to him saying, listen, you know, I think it was a, a, a guy from New Zealand that was like, I was literally ready to give up on life until you reached out to me and made me sort of clear things out and, and everything kind of became... <sighs> clear and my mind was like no longer hazy and I wasn't in a bad place and it was kind of all because of you and it's like you know, I mean this guy's reaching out to people on the other side of the world for fuck's sake mm-hmm. like just a damn good person and just fucking like I say is just an unbelievable wrestler yeah you can't ask anything more of him he's doing his best yep he will get that title at one point and if if there is more crossover between 205 and the main roster as we've seen with the likes of Lucha House Party, Leo Rush, Drake Maverick, it's possible that I can yep. sort of transcend over. So, I'm, I mean, on, this, on the other hand, I'm happy that it's kept separate because I still get to see my staff at Ali have matches every other couple of weeks. 20 minute barn burners, puts on excellent shows all the time. So, see if I just take it, like, try and ignore the. 205 live shit because no one watches it. It's like, well, if you just sit and watch it, you'll be entertained for it. It's not even an hour, it's 50 minutes of your time. Mm-hmm. There's decent matches. You've got most of the roster are used every week, whether it's tag matches or vignettes, or what do you call them? These selfie videos that are the rage right now. They're getting used, so if you just sit and watch it, you might not be so dismissive of it. Yep. Yep, completely agree. I did enjoy the <clears throat> the Seth Nakamura match. It had a slow start, but that seems to be Seth's MO where his matches get better as they go on. Probably the most motivated I've seen Nakamura in a long time. Yeah, and like I said, it was a slow start. They were kind of like trolling one another. Um, just trying to... I even sent that message into our WhatsApp group that like, that match just a little bit slow but now it's starting to pick up the the closing sequence to end in the match <clears throat> I thought was just was really really good um, so Nakamura goes for Kinsasha I think it was was it did he and then misses it Seth gets out of the way Nakamura's kind of on his knees trying to get looking to get back up and Seth hits curb stomp I thought the ending to that match was phenomenal. Yes. The only the only surprise about it was I think we were all kind of expecting Ambrose to come down and cost Seth at some point. Or at least come down post match. Um, but he never did. I thought overall I thought it was a real good match to be honest with you. Like you say, it was kind of slow to start off with, but then really started picking up in the last sort of fifteen odd minutes. Um yeah, I get no complaints about that match whatsoever. I don't think Seth needed the win for this one, though. I don't think he did either. I don't think he did either. I think you could have had Nakamura win it because, like I say, he's he's really been anonymous. Like I know he featured, he was featured heavily in Asia Styles Food. Obviously, it was it was a main event. Didn't obviously win it, and then he's won. He's got the US title, but it's like, does anyone even remember he had the US title? So it's been quite underwhelming. It's been kind of disappointing. Six months or nine months or so for him. Um, mm-hmm. I say they could have used that win. Could have maybe propelled him up again. Um, yeah, like the kind of impression you're getting from. I don't know if it's Nakamura himself or is it a case of bad booking and or maybe a combination of both that 
he's kind of like Brock and Randy in the sense that he want, he'll turn it on when he feels like turning it on, when he feels that like he's got the right opponent. Uh-huh. I just, but, even, see, even if Dean didn't turn up, which he didn't, but if if Seth was preoccupied mentally to the point where Nakamura took advantage, I think that would have made more sense. And I mean, I've not got, there's been this thing about the clean sweep where Raw won. Even, we'll get to the, the fact that it wasn't a clean sweep in a minute, but people are not happy that SmackDown were on paper buried, squashed as it were. And I think from a storyline perspective, it would have made more sense for SmackDown to pick up the victory in this one. For Nakamura to get himself as a US champion a bit of momentum, a bit of confidence, and for Seth to lose confidence, even though he's an IC champ with the upcoming match against Dean Ambrose at TLC, just would have made a bit more sense for me, story-wise. And then, and then what you could have went ahead and done was, Shane could have still tweeted out that nonsense that things are going to change, or there's going to be a shake-up on SmackDown, but you could have then had Nakamura come out and been like, being that cocky, arrogant, like, well, I win. None of you didn't. Yep. Apart from, obviously, the Usos, because the Usos got the victory as well. Oh, what was that all about? <laughs> I mean... What, like, First thing, let's that, get the posit- positives out of the way. Right. The fact that it was the Usos that get the win, it shows how highly we still think of them. And the Usos kind of not been doing it in the last six months. Bothers me, but it also doesn't, because there's just a real lack of tag teams. But it doesn't bother me in a sense that you kind of need them out of the title scene for a little bit, but let's bring them back into it now, because they are by far the best tag team in the company. Um, without a doubt so like, I'm all for I think you kind of need to rotate people in and out of the title scene but they've done fucking nothing for the last six months and that's been a disappointing thing um, let's put it like this by not acknowledging what took place in the pre-show the WWE have told you whatever happens on the pre-show doesn't matter and don't bother watching they didn't even they didn't, how they usually show highlights of the pre-show Mm-hmm. Did they show highlights of the pre-show during the main card? I'm not entirely sure. I can't be sure. I can't be false because if they did, then we'd have to acknowledge that SmackDown got the win and it wasn't a clean sweep. But for me, bottom line is Vince McMahon has told the fans, do not watch a pre-show because yep. it means fucking nothing. We don't care about tag team wrestling, so you don't have to. We don't, uh, we don't, uh, we don't care about that and we don't care about the pre-show. Like, Why on earth would you... Why would you do that to something that you're promoting? Why would you do that something to one of your own products where you're basically telling people not to bother watching it? Because, like I say, whatever happens on it means fucking nothing. Like, so why would you waste your time watching something that has no meaning? I mean, this is why I was relieved that Mustafa Ali and Murphy were on the main card because nobody. We are told by WWE not to care about the pre show. Well, Hundred percent. You cannot argue otherwise. You cannot argue any other way. You can't be like, "Oh, it's just a pre-show," or "No, they're not telling you." No, they are fucking telling you that. They're telling you, "Do not bother watching the pre-show because it doesn't mean anything." Simple mm-hmm. as that. I know. I mean, as you say, it's good that the Usos got the victory. And that's the only positive that, like I says, they kind of reminded themselves and everyone else that, like, yeah, do I don't worry, we know what we've got here, and these guys. Did you see what his dad, his dad, their dad said? No. Big Rikishi? No. Well, he was, there's some breaking news about him. Uh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, oh, I'm sorry in advance. It was caught, it was made news that he attempted smear campaigns against both the Republican presidential nominees in the last few years. In 2008 and 2012, I think it was John McCain was the first one, and I can't I can't remember the name of the second guy. When he was asked for his reasons, he said, "I did it for Barack." What did you think of the women's five on five match? <sighs> Nothing. <laughs> I'm just moving past that awful joke. You didn't think anything of it? No, I really didn't. Actually, it was quite boring. If I'm being brutally I like, honest. I really liked the Sasha and Asuka face-off outside the ring. Uh-huh. That was good. And it's funny, because Asuka's done 
next to fucking nothing in about 10 months. I know she won the Royal Rumble and then she was in the Wrestle... She had that great match at WrestleMania. Sasha's... You know, the exact same. She's been carrying um, some injuries. Yep. Um, she has been, but when, when she's there, she hasn't treated like the style that she is. Um... And it just kind of showed you when the crowd, the crowd fucking popped for them too. And it shows you what people still think of them. That face-off was amazing. It kind of it kind of took me back to remember AJ and Nakamura had the face-off at the Money in the Bank. Yes. They kind of picked, both picked the ladder up and moved out of the way and just goes right. Well, we need to. One of us need to. One of us needs to ultimately knock the other one out here in order to win a title. And it was kind of they both had that just face off outside the ring and they both acknowledge right well let's take this to inside the ring um, that was that was goosebump kind of moment um, yeah so yeah that was about it Nia Jax getting booed the hell out of the building as well Pete Magnet <sighs> I mean fine she's getting booed because of what she's done to Becca she's not getting booed because of like good heel work or anything like that but Fuck, she's getting booed. Like, do what you want to do with her. Like, just continually keep talking about how she hurt Becky if you want. Just to continue getting booed. Like, continue all that all you want. Um, doesn't really bother me because I've never really cared for Naya in the first place. Like, I felt like she's capable of having like good enough matches. Um, and a match against Ronda Rousey was a real good match as well. I like that she's tapped into the people saying that she's a bad wrestler oh that's awesome because when she's posting stuff about don't worry my fist is going to be okay when she had the cut and stuff like that and it's just like and then that's getting people worked up and it's like can you not fucking see she's just doing it to piss you off and uh-huh. you're rising to it and now people are going like oh well your troll game sh- piss you shit nah 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 you're reacting to it like it shows you she knows what she's doing and she's doing it just to get a rise out of people and just laugh at people yeah I find that quite funny. I like how people are getting heated about Nia Jax. I find it real funny. I think that's, I just I mean, just get the popcorn out and just kind of see the nonsense that yeah, people are saying. Get that big E popcorn gif on the go. Yep. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Nia Jax is good in the ring or anything like that whatsoever. I just, like I said, all I'm saying is I find it funny that that she's just doing this now to get a reaction out of people. Kayfabe is well and truly alive with stuff like yeah. this. Yeah, it's quite it's just people are getting worked into a shoot, brother, brother, as they say. And okay, there's um, there's a sort of real thing behind it, but they're still they're still playing into the company's hands. They're getting that heat before a Ronda Rousey match. The Ronda Rousey situation's a bit iffy, granted. Um, oh, that's that's it's crazy how quickly people are turning on her. Uh huh. I know she's kind of not helping herself, but bearing in mind the promo she cuts are not her actual promos. And at the end of the day, you know, you know when you come across just someone who's wittier, wittier than you, and just you know, and that's what it is in this case. You know, it's almost like you trying to slag a comedian. You know, you're like, just don't bother wasting your time. And that's the kind of impression you get with the Becky Lynch thing. But she keeps going and going. Um, when it comes to like mic work and the ability just to slap your opponent down, like she can't compete with Becky. Um, but yeah, like people are really, really turning on her, and they've turned on her real fast. Mm-hmm. And some of the things I've been seeing as well, like I'm, it's not just one. I've saw several tweets talking about how Shane is far superior to Ronda in the ring, which. To me, it's just... No shit, Sherlock. No shit, exactly. It's like... Really? Like, that's your hot take for the day? <laughs> like, really? Like, I'm, I'm flabbergasted by when people say stuff like that. Because, folks, newsflash, just in case any of you fucking imbeciles didn't realise, Shayna Baszler's been wrestling for three years now. Mm-hmm. And Shana. Ronda Rousey's barely been wrestling for six, seven months. I would expect Shayna to be better and more advanced than Ronda is. But like, it's the t- I think they just turned on her because she was against Becky. Probably, probably. Yeah, I think so. I think so, and it kind of exposed 
it, we kind of knew how limited she was in it, like on the mic and stuff like that, and it kind of exposed that even more. And I think because Becky's so over, it kind of didn't really matter who Becky was coming against. Becky was always going to people were always going to side with Becky there. Um, but like now we're acting like Ronda isn't like getting better in the ring, and, and she isn't like she is, she's capable of putting on good matches. Yeah, she's still green as hell. Yeah, she's still learning. Of course, you expect that. Um. I mean, I. But the comparisons to Shayna just it just blows my mind. I, ha- I hadn't seen that stuff myself, but yeah, I mean, I don't get, I don't care that much because it's obvious. But I, you know, fine well that I am not Ronda Rousey's number one fan. Yep. But this, it's just, it seems to me. First, it was Charlotte, then it was Nia, then it was Ronda. It's just whoever's against Becky, people will aim, aim yeah. shit at basically. Yep, that's it. That is it. And just wait until you see people losing their mind when Ronda makes her tap in the middle of the ring at WrestleMania. <laughs> in two minutes. Like, I mean, I love Becky. I think her... She's always been a great wrestler. But I'm not going to turn around and say that I've always cared about Becky. Oh. I'm not going to bullshit people like that. Okay, there's been a couple of ill-advised... Not even ill-advised, sort of misused terms and promos... It's not the first person to do that. And there are other people who get a break for saying worse in promos. And Millennial is a can be very broadly defined, but one of the sort of... I think what, what Ronda's getting at is that entitled generation who thinks everything's owed to them. They're savvy on social media and stuff like that. Becky is constantly, when she's not sleeping, when she's not wrestling, she's on social media... Destroying everyone, trolling everyone, showing that she's better than everyone. There's kind of a mild definition of millennial in there. So, okay, using it over and over again, stop it, but it's just one of those ones blown out of proportion, I would say. And then she comes out with the whole penis envy thing, and it's like, what the fuck? What was that one? I need to find it, but basically Rhonda was talking about Becky having penis envy or something along those lines. Well, she's calling herself the man round about the time of the Women's Evolution pay-per-view and she's trying to rise herself above everyone else. So I can, again, I can see where she's coming from. Um, but can't wait to figure out where it is. I would rather that just not say stuff, ignore her. Oh, you could do because like I say at the end of the day you're not really going to win that feud but as we've just said there everyone on Twitter is going crazy about it so it's working okay and this might not be the desired reaction for Ronda Rousey but there is a vested interest Ronda Rousey's name has been hashtagged all over Twitter the hits are going up the algorithms or whatever they use it's all going in positive or negative it's on an upward tra- trajectory yep what were your thoughts on the men v men match? I was pleasantly surprised by this one. You know, I thought Drew was going to feature more. You must have been. I raging. thought this was. I thought this was going to be all about Drew. Um, disappointed that Joe lasted about thirty seconds, but if he's oh, hurt or he's working hurt, it makes sense. Well, don't uh, that that pissed me off. Yeah, I know what you're going to say, don't put him in the match. Well, if that's the way you're going to do it, I would rather it happen to someone like Joe, who can go away and heal up, rather than it happen to someone like Almas, who was just thrown in the match and basically got never got to showcase anything. Um, well, just don't do yeah. something like that in the first place. Or do it to Jeff Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, that would be good. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. I'm not going to say it blew me away or anything like that. I didn't expect much from it. Um, I think I was actually... I had um, reservations going into the match because Raw just were fighting with each other, but they actually fought with each other during the match. And I thought yeah, that was, that was, quite, quite, cool. was, it was quite good. You could see the bit where Finn Balor tagged himself in against Drew and then insecurity his head. That was amazing. <laughs> For no reason whatsoever. I know, it's like, who do you think you are? Big Scottish, Scottish boy. I guess... And it'll probably kind of please Kyle, but it doesn't please me that I wanted to see more of Drew. 
I, like, to be honest, I think Drew featured quite a bit in the match, but he did. I just felt we were going to see more of Drew. Right. Um, well, you know what we got to see more of instead? Instead of oh, Drew? Oh, oh Shane, Shane McMahon. Shane McMahon. Uh, yep, 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 Yeah, I got nothing to say about that. I've said it before. I said it in the Crown Jewel review. I won't go down that road again. But there's no need for Shane McMahon to be involved in active storylines, I would say. Paige was doing a fine job. The Miz doesn't need a Shane McMahon feud. I'm alright with Shane coming on SmackDown every other week and stuff. Aye. I'm fine with him being like an on-screen character. I don't mind that. I just don't need to see you wrestling. And... I've just come to accept that we're kind of going to see that like once a year or whatever or twice a year. That doesn't mean I want it. Well, just like with AJ, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, don't be surprised if the Miz's stock falls. Slowly. Uh, but uh, man, they're going to do Miz Daniel Bryan. I'm telling you, Miz is going to be the babyface. In WrestleMania? Miz is a babyface. Like, seriously, family man got a wife kid does a TV show does movies or whatever kind of like yeah fine he does movies maybe not great ones STD good. straight to DVD good. yep yep good looking guy and it's a kind of like I came into the business uh, like and as a as a reality star and I've busted my ass off and look where I've got to all because of hard work that's your fucking that's your that's a story that's a uh, fairy tale story right there in a sense mm-hmm. um, I think he's Big time money if you turn down face. In the process, he fucking gave Daniel... He got Daniel Bryan got his comeuppance. Because hate- remember, Daniel Bryan started this feud with him as... For no reason whatsoever on that uh, Talk Smack episode. Where he called the Miz a coward for no reason. Uh, yes, okay. Yeah, and Miz has been defending himself ever since. He's cheated along the way. I, Daniel Bryan cheated to get this uh, WWE title just like Miz has been telling him all along that that's what you need to do in order to win mm-hmm. and the Miz tweeted out saying that he either tweeted it or it was on Instagram I've, that I've been telling you about I've been telling you this all along Do we have to talk about the Daniel Bryan Brock Lesnar match? <sighs> do you know what? I thought Josh in the messenger group kind of summed up perfectly. The first kind of like three quarters or whatever was a typical Brock match or the first two thirds and then the final third of the match it was kind of exciting. Um, I thought Daniel Bryan died in front of our our very eyes when he got that first German suplex. He literally landed on his head um, and then Brock pulling him up uh, after he hits an F5 to finish him kind of shows Brock's streak, his mean streak and how he just wants to cut, just hurt everyone and that kind of ultimately was almost his downfall I thought the last sort of like 7 or 8 minutes or so was quite exciting um, it, kayfabe wise it kind of gave you that hope that Daniel Bryan might win or that sense that Daniel Bryan might win. Daniel Bryan was never going to win, nor should he have ever won. I don't think that should have, been, should have ever been considered. Uh, like I say, it was a typical Brock match, and then it kind of got good. Well, no, it didn't. <laughs> okay. I, it's just, we've seen it before, the, the, the small guy gets two places around the ring, they make a comeback, and at the end of the day, it's all for nothing. Just like the rest of his outside of Survivor Series when he's facing the big monsters, they get treated like a threat. When it comes to crunch time, doesn't matter worth a shit. And that was near enough a carbon copy of match that they had with AJ Styles last year, Daniel Bryan this year. So even Survivor Series has fallen into that pattern of small guy takes it to Brock, but at the end of the day it doesn't work. I have yeah, no, yeah, yeah, but, no but interest... Outside. But outside of Roman Reigns, right, none of the other big guys have posed a threat whatsoever to Brock. So, 
right. Bronze had his ass handed to him twice by Brock. So why should I get my hopes up for any Brock match whatsoever? You shouldn't, because Brock's a piece of shit. Fuck Brock. So why? But I will. But I will acknowledge. I've acknowledged. I, for me, someone who hates Brock, like I said, that last five, six, seven minutes or so was quite exciting. I thought. I just didn't care. I, I knew what would happen. Oh, I I agree. I didn't care, and I knew it would happen as well. But I still found it quite exciting because. I, I, I always felt going into the match, I thought Daniel Bryan would get enough offence in to kind of make him look like a threat, but never actually win it. There was a couple of occasions where, let's say, uh, you could have felt like, oh, we might actually do it, but, you know, you never... People who understand, or who feel like they understand the business, or people who feel like they're clued up, never really thought you did, but, from a, I say, from a KFA point of view... <clears throat> Like, there was moments in that match where you felt like, oh my goodness, Daniel Bryan's going to win. <sighs> the only positive in that match for me was that yes, lock looked tight. That's all. I was just, I was kind of just waiting for it to finish so I can turn the, turn my candle off. Uh, it was, it was. A, I thought it was a decent, hard hitting affair. The last seven minutes or so, though. I was and Daniel Bryan jogging around the start of the match as well. Oh, what an arsehole. Was an absolute, that's exactly what I was thinking. You're an absolute arsehole. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it was... Stop being a wee dick, Daniel Bryan. Exactly. And it was kind of good. People were, people were... I think people have forgotten just how great of a heel he is. Mm-hmm. And he's just getting booed on SmackDown as well. The heel turn might not be to everyone's tastes, but... You're not supposed neither, to like neither, heel turns. Neither was the Becky one. Yep, and look what's happened there. We've got and it was Rich that said that they'd done Daniel Bryan Miz uh, as a dark match after Smackdown and Miz was like kind of like the baby face there. Who would have thought that would ever happen? Yeah, because we all thought it would be the other way around, but I'm just glad we're getting it. I, th- oh, I think we will still get it at WrestleMania. I mean, see the... TLC is looking not bad. You've got a match. Oh, yeah. AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan. Stipulation to be determined. Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. Again, stipulation to be determined. Uh, Nia Jackson, Ronda Rousey. The crowd's going to be hot for that. There was going to be Braun versus Corbin, but Braun is seemingly out of action for quite some time now with an elbow injury. Yeah, they'll probably run that match at a random row, I think, then, because... Uh-huh. That's a legit elbow injury. That's a couple of times. I don't know if it's the same elbow as last time when he was I'm out. Not sure. A couple, two years ago, was it? Um, I can't remember. No, I can't remember. No, just last springtime he was out for a while. Great balls of fire season. Uh, that's a worry. If it's the same elbow, then that could be a recurring issue. Mm. And I have to kind of very grudgingly accept that they'd, they were in a corner with regards to Brock Lesnar winning the title at Crown Jewel. You could press rewind and change about two or three months worth of booking. Roman Reigns thing happened. It was little, very little they could do. It's had repercussions long term going forward, but I hold my hands up. I should quickly bring them back down, but I hold my hands up. Yep. I was... Disappointed in the tag team champs match. Yeah, it was a bit, yeah. I feel as that if that never, a bit there. that never got off the ground at all. No. I guess it's just... Offers of pain aren't where they need to be at the moment. Mm, I, th- I, th- I think they're improving though. They are improving, but they're just, yeah. they don't do much for me. They never have. Yeah. I know a lot of people had their high expectations of this match and like he says it never really never really took off and then you had the whole Drake Maverick peeing himself incident by the way I don't know what he Slater and Rhino were laughing at because everyone's talking about him rather than them after Survivor Series <laughs> no I'm saying <laughs> yeah the Peanuts, and it's not my kind of humour, but I couldn't care less about it. Oh, I mean, it's not my humour either. Um, but I'm not raging about it. It was just, ha ha, it's funny. Okay, but 
subjects quite popular right now. It's probably the most popular it's been since coming to WWE. It's kind of worked out well for him. Mm. Mm. I think we've covered all the matches now. We have. Overall, I thought it was a relatively solid show. I, well, I think it was solid. There wasn't anything that truly annoyed me. No. Women's match was it was okay. What? The five v five women's oh, match. Oh, five. Right, okay. But, like, the, <laughs> Calm yourself. The matches, down. the matches that I never had any expectation for, either delivered, lived up, lived up to my expectations in the sense that they didn't do anything, or they kind of exceeded it a little bit. Um, so I wasn't really too bothered with those ones, and the ones I had expectations for delivered. Outside maybe that uh, tag team match. Uh huh, that was a bit pointless. Um, anything from Raw or SmackDown that you want to cover? Before we do some quiz action. Um, just a, a quick question. Does. I saw a lot of people talking about it. We were talking about it in the Messenger group, and there's a lot of things on Twitter. Does. Um, Dean Ambrose's line about Roman Reigns bother you? But one the oh when he was saying that Roman has to answer to his maker. Yes. Uh, no. I mean, obviously, it's one of those ones you don't like to hear it. It's not a nice thing to hear Dean Ambrose, this guy who we've supported like fervently, furiously for six years now to say something like that but I think it's one of those ones that's the story they're trying to get across he's going down a dark road now I don't know if you've seen it in fact we did talk about it before we started recording I watched his chronicle and a documentary it's like a kayfabe documentary about him returning from injury and when he was off during that time he comes back and he's fighting fights that he wasn't involved in in the first place he's the squeaky he's the third wheel on a two wheeled bike and he was in a dark place. He's still not technically still not given a proper explanation for what's going on in his head and why he turned on Seth. So we're supposed to not like him. He's in a bad place just now. So he blamed he blamed not blamed Roman. He brought up Roman's cancer. It was in bad taste, but I'm trying. Like it's one of those ones where people are choosing to be mad at the company rather than the character. And if that's the case then WWE, they're, they're in a lose-lose situation. If people aren't going to embrace a fiction, it doesn't matter what they're trying to do, because it's, it's like a lose-lose. I'm, I'm annoyed at Dean. I'm sure I'm sure Roman Reigns was alright with him saying that. I'm sure Dean was maybe uncomfortable saying that, but he said it anyway. Everyone was on board with it. But is this another one of those ones where people choose what they'd be offended by? Because a few weeks ago, I can't remember if it was before Evolution or not. Not exactly on the same level. Becky Lynch poked fun at Edge, Edge's neck, which was, you know, like one or two bumps away from complete, complete paralysis at the very least. I'll give you a, an even better one. Becky Lynch poked fun at Ronda Rousey in a, one of her many tweets about hiding under a blanket after her loss at UFC when it was like a known fact that Rousey was having suicidal ideations at that time. So, see, mental health is a big deal these days. It's in the front, the forefront of a lot of people's minds. It's treated more seriously. Is what Dean Ambrose said more callous than what Becky said to Rousey? Um, but it's all right, because Becky said it. I don't have an issue. I, I don't. With what he said, um, <clears throat> I know a lot of people said it was done in bad taste, and I kind of I I understand that point of view, um, because end up, this is a company that basically that had who was it was it Edge or whoever it was go out and say shit about Eddie Guerrero like days after he died. Uh, Orton. Orton. It's you know, CM Punk taking the piss out of Paul Bader. With the ashes, yep. Yeah. Um, 
Can you tell me, I remember I didn't watch it at that time, how did that go down? I think it was just more so, oh, for me it was like, oh, punk, you piece of shit. It wasn't WWE, you pieces of shit? No, because at the time, like, you kind of, if it happened, you were like, right, well, the relevant people have signed off on it. Because you just know if Taker turned around and goes, I don't want this done, it's not getting done. And if you don't think that Ambrose or someone run that line past Roman, then you're nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and I saw people saying, like, imagine being a cancer survivor or being a family member of someone who survived cancer, tuning in and seeing them use that for a cheap heater or whatever. Uh-huh. Imagine how offended you would be. Well, we're both family members of survivors. Yes. Exactly, and... I explained what my ex you I said on the podcast a few weeks ago when we were talking about Roman what my sister went through. Like where she was literally we were literally told on like two or three occasions, like just, you know, prepare start preparing yourselves. And I remember seeing her like lying there, like she looked gaunt, she looked yellow, she looked as if she was gone. And to be honest, and it it doesn't bother me. Um just in the same way that it doesn't bother me if I watch a film of a woman or a man or someone being raped because that happens on a daily basis. Yep. Like that kind of like watching things like that don't bother me because it's part of the story. Yeah, whether you like it or not, it's um, supposed to invoke a reaction. I do, yeah, I do understand why people don't like it, and I do think it might have been it is a little bit in poor taste. But you know, one could also argue that what Ambrose said was religious related as well and I'm not going to, I don't want to start preaching but I'm a firm believer that in this in this life I'm constantly being tested day in day out um, and you're being tested to see whether or not you're worthy in the afterlife um and to just to go one little further, like in this real life, there's a, an Australian boy who was around young, maybe four or five years younger than us, diagnosed with cancer, who was like, money was not an option, like wasn't even an issue. Like rolling in money, was diagnosed with cancer, set up charity, gave all his money away, and actually turned around and said he was gifted with cancer. And he was gifted with cancer because he says, this is kind of me being given a chance to, to make do the right thing now in my life and make amends and it's like so he could have been coming at it in the religious aspect as well but bottom line it never really offended me too much but I understand why people might not have liked it because it wasn't in the best of taste but, no, but if we're Roman to... or people close to Roman or his family or whatever signed off on that like, I, I, you can guarantee that I believe or even if if they never signed off, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be annoyed about it because they're all about telling. I, they should. That's what's lost today. Fans are too smart. I don't it, think they're too smart. Well, I. You know what I mean. We, we, it was included. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, I was included, and uh, it would just be annoyed at Dean Ambrose, so you could invest in the product more instead of being annoyed at Vince. And the thing is, I know a lot of people are coming at it like this storyline didn't need that. The storyline doesn't need the IC title. I get it. I get it from both sides. I get it from both sides. I really do. But for me personally, it didn't bother me because for me, he turned around and goes, "What Roman's going through, like, is because of past mistakes or whatever it was." He says, and he's now needs to answer to his maker. And like I say, from a religious aspect, I relate to that. Mhm. So, you know. They're doing it like I'm not liking Dean Ambrose right now. I'd never thought I'd say that. Like watching him in that documentary or the Kayfabe documentary, he's a tortured soul right now. So I can I don't see where he's coming from, but I understand he's going through some dark shit. He and, was, and that's it. Like he, when you're going through like a bad time and in, in a dark place, you don't you're not thinking straight. He nearly, and you're not, you don't have the ability to make proper decisions. He nearly died as well. Don't forget. Yep. This is straight out of Renee Young's mouth. Yep. And he was going through it. Well, by all accounts, was kind of like in a dark place himself, like trying to deal with the injury and like kind of not knowing what to do himself. 
and then he comes back and he's putting his body through shit again for other people's fights. And, I, and that's what he kind of he touched on as well in that documentary where he was talking about Roman being his work wife and he's no longer there and people don't see the hard work that people that they put in, etc., etc. And it's all just about the fame and glory, but they don't realise just how difficult it is and stuff. It's a fucking great documentary. It's really, really good. Uh, it's a bit depressing, though. Uh, it is, but you kind of get an insight into like him personally and what his character's going through and what he went through. So, have they, have they uh, done, I, I think it's good. Have they done other Chronicle episodes? Because it seems to me this is like a kayfabe thing. I'm not sure. I know they had the, the AJ 365. Yeah. I've not watched that yet. I'll be watching that at the weekend, I think. I'm looking forward to watching that one because the Kevin Owens one was excellent. Yeah. And I saw a little clip in the AJ one where Paul Heyman cut a promo and he told AJ, don't leave. I want you to stand right here and watch what I'm about to say. And he said and he was talking about AJ just being, like, the greatest person he's actually witnessed. And, like, he puts him in that same bracket as Flair and HBK and stuff like that. And you mm-hmm. could kind of see, once he'd done his promo, they turned and shook hands. Like, you could see, like, AJ was getting choked up during it. And you could see how genuine Paul Heyman was with it. And it wasn't just a stupid promo he was cutting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that'll be a good watch as well. Uh, these these things on the network are excellent. Well worth oh, the, they really are. Well worth the nine ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> so, unless you want to talk about a um, uh, Thanksgiving dinner street fight, will we move on to the quiz? Yeah, let's move on. Oh, before we do move on, happy Thanksgiving to all our American listeners. Yes. Listen to this as you wait for the turkey to roast. Indeed. And you can turn around and say, do you know what? I'm thankful for Ricky and Clyde. (laughs) (laughs) You can have two yams on your plate. Call call one of them Ricky and call the other one Clive. And you you too can have a Thanksgiving dinner with some Scottish lads. It's fucking quiz time with Ricky and Clive and friends. A fucking WWE quiz. Right, the quiz this week. A uh, funny side story. It's half past seven, eight o'clock British Standard Time. We were having a conversation on what's that with Carl from Outsiders Edge. We were talking about unicorns, Miz, plastic currency. Um, so I asked him for a theme for tonight's show and it's kind of tonight's quiz, sorry and it's kind of turned, in, turned into a quiz all about the people who Ricky hates the most and their time in WWE so, ten questions five people, two questions each you ready? Fun, fun enough folk, it's not just all about Brock Lesnar I hate a few more people than top of that I, I know what you mean Right, you ready? Yep. Number one. How many times was Razor Ramon Intercontinental Champion? Oof. Hey, um, yo. Is it a multiple choice? No. Do you want, I suppose you want a multiple choice then? Yeah, because it could be in. Four, five, or six? Four. Correct answer. Number two. At what pay-per-view did Scott Hall make his return to WWE? (sighs) And that's after WCW? Yes, so at like when they came back as the NWO and WWF. Uh, You've not got a clue, do you? No. I remember he had the match at Mania with Steve Austin. Um, no. Um, what pay per view? Uh huh. Have a have a. I'll give you a clue. Mm-hmm. NWO. Wait, that's my fucking clue? It is, yes. At what pay-per-view did they return? Uh-huh. As part of the N 
W O. Do you give up? I know they came back, but I don't know what pay per view that was. Part, uh, fuck Scott Hall. What's the answer? No way out. N W O. Fuck. Oh, I loved No Way Out back in the day. I loved it. Loved it. Loved it. <laughs> Number three. Who did Ric Flair defeat to become the Intercontinental Intercontinental Champion at Unforgiven 2005? Um, it's kind of ironic, is it not? No, the answer the is answer, not. The answer? It, it's not Alanis Morissette. I spit in the faces of people who don't oh, want to be cool. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I see what you did there. I see what you did there. <laughs> Do you know that only us two marked out for that one? Yeah, I know. Number four. What did was... you did you did you have that question intentionally, or was that just just sheer luck? I uh, know I didn't even think. I was thinking about <laughs> Ric Flair. Um, what was the match opponent and stipulation of Ric Flair's first match back for WWF? After all the the invasion angle stuff, <sighs> fucking hell. Um, uh, you want a clue? Yeah. Right. Well, what was the story with Ric Flair coming back? Can you remember? No. He was sold some of the the rights to SmackDown or WCW, ECW by Shane and Vince, Shane and Stephanie, after the invasion angle. Um, so what was the question again? What was the match? What was his first match back? So who was it against? What pay-per-view? And what was the stipulation? You're not going to get it, are you? Was it a match with Vince McMahon? It was. And was it something like the winner got full control of Raw and SmackDown or Raw or just SmackDown or something? I'll rephrase the question. What was the gimmick? That kind of situation. Oh, right. I don't think I know, to be honest. Um, uh, right, so it's obviously... Fuck it. Um, no DQ? Street fight. Ah, same thing. Um, no, because in no DQ matches you don't wear jeans. Street fights. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the pay-per-view? The Rumble? Correct. Two out of three ain't bad, as they say. Number five, what was Hulk Hogan's last match for WWE? Jesus. You, is it the case of you hate these guys so much you just try to erase them from your memory? Do you know what it is? I was never a fan of these folk, anyway. I Like you say, I once did say I don't get what the big deal is about Ric Flair. I know, but I'm trying to pick questions that were um, within your time of watching it. I know, but, oh God almighty, I don't like these folk at all. Uh, last ever match. Will I give you a clue? Was it, was it SummerSlam? It was. That was good. Mr. Keith Orton. Keith, brother Keith, uh-huh. <laughs> I think his daughter was involved in it in some way or shape, some shape or form as well. Yes, uh, Randy Orton was flirting with Brooke. Brooke, yep. Number six, what was Hogan's... Was Hogan the heavyweight champion more times in WCW or WWE? So, the heavyweight title in all its different forms... In WCW or WWF? Mm. Uh-huh. Oh, how many times did I hold it in WCW? Oh, that's a good question. Thanks. I'm going to go with... Mm. Um... Um... 
WWF. He won the title six times in WWF. He won the title six times in WCW. Oh, for fuck's sake. A wee bonus question for you. When did Hulk Sorry. when did <laughs> when did Hogan's racism first become evident in WWE? Well a lot of people, right? That's that's breaking news people, right? A lot of people are gonna think it was the the incident was it what, twenty fourteen ish? Fifteen, yeah. Fifteen. Absolute scumbag. But I'm gonna let you know folks, that wasn't it. It was actually WrestleMania twenty one. When he came charging into the ring and vanquished Davari and the forgotten brother, Muhammad Hassan. <laughs> oh, that's a... It's the truth. It's the truth. It's the correct answer. Number seven. <laughs> <laughs> aye, 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 aye. Uh, Backlash 2002 was Brock Lesnar's pay-per-view debut. Who was the match against? It was against 2002. <coughs> Forgotten brother. <laughs> uh, thingy. Brother Nero. Are you looking up the answers right now? No, for real, no. Because you're looking away from the camera and there's some tap, tap, tappy, tapping going on. Yes, on my glass. Right. Uh, yes, correct answer. Number eight. How many times has Brock Lesnar been the heavyweight champion in all its in all its forms and guises? I had to Google this one. Round. For anyone who's hard of, not even hard of hearing, for who's, who can't translate mumbling, he said, how many times was he the champion the first time around? I'm going to see either three or four. All in. I don't know how many times we went it the first time around. Mate, right, we'll pick an answer. Let me see if I can figure out the range. Two sex, wait. Oh, two sex while I'll Google it. How am I Googling it? I'm looking right at you straight on the fucking camera. Well, here is a bird for you. Five. Incorrect. Six. Hard lines. Number nine. Name the two people who CM Punk cashed his money in the bank briefcase in on. <clears throat> Edge. What's the other one? Fuck. Edge, Edge and... Was it Jeff? You were right with one of the answers. Which one did I get right? I got Edge, right? When was the Edge one? Was it not Edge? Was it Jeff and who? Who the fuck's up? Well, according to the, the fine... the fine world of Wikipedia, it was someone else than Jeff. Who the fuck was it? But do you know, I remember what you're saying. Right, let's just call this one a dud, because you got the bonus point correct. I thought it was Batista. I have been... Uh, why, why, what's the edge thing about, though? Which edge bit? Because didn't, didn't someone like Big Show or someone lay edge out and, and funk him down and cashed in on him? Is it not Kennedy? What is that? No, Kennedy lost his. Ladies and gents, if you have the answer for that one, at Ricky and Clive on Twitter. 
um, at RNC on Bebo or MySpace. Number 10. All other members of the Straight Edge Society have appeared in WWE. Uh, sorry, two seconds. So, so 2008, Punk cashed his Money in the Bank contract after Batista beat down Edge and won the title. Make an eye. Ah, see, there's probably a case of me not reading Wikipedia properly and just skimming the paragraph. Right. Sorry, go ahead. Number 10. All other members of the Straight Edge Society have appeared in WWE since it disbanded. True or false? Fuck, who is the woman in it again? Her name was Serena. Hey, well, we're on Gallows House. Obviously. Mm-hmm. I can't be certain about the woman. Right, so... Who was the other person? Oh, the woman hasn't, so... No, the answer's no. Right, well, it's, that's incorrect. Oh, when did she come back? Right, so you've got Luke Gallows... Joey Mercury. Oh, aye. And Serena Deep, who was in last year's May Young Classic. <laughs> Fuck sake. Sorry, sorry, not sorry. And for people wondering, right, I absolutely love CM Punk and I can't wait for the day he comes back, but CM Punk is a first class dickhead. That's why he's on this list. Mm hmm. Maybe if I gave you my five next week, you can quiz me on them. Yep, hopefully they're different. They probably will be different from mine because I think mine's have got some kind of shock value to it. I'll I'll pick five different ones then. Because I don't like Brock, you know that. I've never liked Scott Hall. Hulk Hogan, I hated him even before his racist ways. And Ric Flair, I just don't get it. <laughs> um. Well, that brings us to the show, the, st- the stuttering end to the show. Anything you want to plug before we stop? Nah, I'll leave that to you. Okay, I've said a few times we are at Ricky and Clive on Twitter on Facebook. On Facebook as well, you've got the Wrestling Squared Circle Facebook group where you can come and chat about all things wrestling. With regards to the podcast network, we've got ourselves, Outsider's Edge, Grown Men Watch This Shit, Keeping it strong style, and our friends who will, we will be eternally sorry to, <laughs> uh, <laughs> One Nation Radio, who are also in Lords of Pain. Um, whatever app you're using, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, give us five stars. Uh, socialsuplex.com, you can check out the podcasts there as well as the columns that we drop, and if you want to get them straight to your inbox, you can subscribe. Breaking, the most breaking of news ever. Did you hear there's a former WCW champion who's bringing out a series of health-conscious dairy products as part of his ongoing business venture? Go on. DDP yoghurt. Right, well, good night, folks. I'm sure you'll get your usual one, one or two pops for your shitty jokes, but take care, folks. Fuck you. Thank you for listening to the Ricky and Clive Wrestling Podcast. We'll see you next time. See you next time.